Hey everyone, I want to tell you about the Los Libertinos podcast. My buddy Carlos Abelar hosts it, and I was just on it on episode number 48, and we went almost two hours and talked about a lot of stuff that I don't even talk about on this show. Carlos lives in Texas. One of the great things I love that he's doing is he is talking about Texas secession and not only talking about it, but he's actually come up with some strategies on how to get people interested in it that I really like. Carlos is a family man. Carlos owns his own business. He's an entrepreneur and just one of the most amazing people out there. So head on over to YouTube, Los Libertinos. I'm also going to have a link down in the show notes. Give him a listen, leave some comments, let them know you love them. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanona show for chapter 10, the very last chapter. I'm here with Charlemagne. How you doing, Charlie? Very well, thank you. And Ryan Turnipseed, first time on the show, even though we've hung out in real life a couple times. So how's it going? Uh, it's going very well. How are you, sir? Doing good, doing good. Why don't I just throw this chapter 10 up since this is basically a summary and it's going to take less than five minutes and then we're going to have a discussion of the um, an overview of the book after that. So let me share this real quick. All right, I'm going to start reading like I've been doing through this whole thing. Anybody, either of you wants to stop, stop me and um, comment. I don't care if it's mid-sentence. Uh, just do it. Feel free. All right. Start reading now. Chapter 10, Conclusion. The, th the thesis of this book has been that democracy is and always has been an illusion in which the true functioning of power where an organized minority elite rule over a, di a disorganized mass is obscured through a lie that the people is sovereign. I have called this the populist delusion because of the power of other lies that this central lie conceals, chiefly the myth of bottom-up power or people power and the entirely inaccurate view of history this lie creates. There is never a substitute for the tightly organized minority. This fact, Mosca's law, is the key lesson of the Italian elite theorists. Gaetano Mosca, Vilfredo Pareto, and Robert Michels I believe that the outbreak of populism in Europe and America that started in 2015 was significantly stymied due to a view of power and the functioning of Western systems that was wholly wrong, which is to say that the people who made up those populist movements believed rearticulations of a false political formula that they were taught in their civics or history classes at school. I think I'd go a step further than that. I would say that the leadership, the the people who presented themselves as the populist leaders, the Trumps, the Orbans of the world, they just they actually believe in democracy. So <laughs> they're they're not going to be able to get anything done within the system the way it has been the way it has been structured. Right. And uh, quite expressly so. Um, and, and they also believed in this sort of like meritocratic view that the system worked, which is why Trump hired people that were absolutely disloyal to him, uh, but appeared to have the expert qualifications. Uh, you know, it's why he staffed his foreign policy side of things with war hawks and complete backstabbing neocons, because they looked on paper the most qualified, but they were not the most loyal. And that's not how this stuff works fundamentally. Right. It was clear that, um, you know, as uh, as Mr. Parvini wrote in the book, uh, very few presidents have actually achieved sovereignty, uh, one of the few being FDR. And it was clear that President Trump believed that he would, in fact, have sovereignty merely by winning the election, which was definitely not true. And that fundamental misunderstanding um, is really what destroyed his presidency more than the fact that his supporters believe that because even if his supporters had believed that myth as is made clear in the book if the president um understood that he was not sovereign merely by winning an election things would have been different 
Yeah. All right. Moving on. The myth of social change being a bottom-up phenomenon pervades our culture and thinking. It is this it is the essential fiction of the 1960s counterculture and the worldview of the baby boomers, or as AA would put it, it's just boomer truth regime. And the sooner, as soon as we can destroy that, the better. The sooner we can destroy that, the better. It is worth returning to the four myths of liberalism that help to perpetuate this worldview. Myth of the stateless society, that state and society were or could ever be separate. Do you have any problem with that, Charlie? Uh, no, and this actually sort of leads into, uh, well, I was planning on offering some criticisms of anarchism. <laughs> okay. I know we still have a few <laughs> libertarians yeah. or anarchists in our midst, uh, including Mr. Carson, um, you know, who I respect greatly. But um, to me, the, the ideal of trying to separate the state from society or any of the other, these other factors, like the economy, as you're about to read, um, it just doesn't make sense as a, a goal or ideal. I mean, I understand the anarchist or libertarian impulse towards freedom. And of course, that's a co totally reasonable uh, con concept for an American to pursue. But I think strictly speaking, the idea of anarchy uh, is a bad idea ideal to hold in your head simply because it's completely impossible um, politically. Like it. it having ideals that aren't achievable um, by man in a religious sense is fine. Um, like the idea of Christianity, no one can be perfect like Christ, right? But in terms of our political or economic or social ideals, um, they should, I believe, be rooted in something that's actually achievable. Um, I don't want to jump the gun here too terribly. Well, let me then let me Ryan let, let okay. me finish reading the four and then I'll let you I'll let you jump in. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I'll read one again. Myth of the stateless society that state and society were or could ever be separate. Myth of the neutral state that state and politics were or could ever be separate. Myth of the free market that state and economy were or could ever be separate. Myth of the separation of powers that competing power centers can realistically endure without converging so do you want to jump in there or do you want me to keep reading <laughs> yeah i i actually just very quickly i actually was going to challenge myself this time and try to defend the whole or not the whole thing but at least parts of the anarchistic worldview uh even though i myself don't fully subscribe to it i don't believe by any uh, measure of the uh measure of the uh, belief system um but the initial things uh I remember whenever this first uh, came out and he talked about the, you know, four myths of liberalism uh, before anyone had really even uh, read the book to find out what exactly he meant. And he said that you can't separate the state from the market. You can't separate the state from society and all this other stuff. And the first thing that my mind uh, initially jumped to was sort of like the enlightened absolutism. You know, the ruler cannot be separated from any of the uh, outgrowths of society, uh, the sort of a uh, sort of Prussian system. Uh, and that's not really what's being articulated here. And I was very happy because uh, uh, Mr. Parvini has done an absolutely splendid job at uh, you know throwing clear, concise definitions out this whole book. And I think it's like you know right at the very start of one of the chapters, um, he defines state as you know a minority that rules over a majority, uh, where the uh, majority has to be ruled. You know. So it's not exactly the typical definition you would get for state from an anarchist or someone like that. So while it is still infeasible, uh, because you're not going to get rid of a uh, class that rules over anyone else, it's not exactly going fully in the other direction either. You can still have great amounts of autonomy, as you do see in history, uh, while still you know, repudiating these four myths here at the end. I figured I would throw that in there just sort of as a... Uh, the, these things are uh, much more uh, strict in definition than they might immediately seem if you haven't read the full book. Well, one thing I would like to say here, because we are basically talking about anarchism, and um, I'm on Facebook, but I'm on one of those famous vacations that I always get for 30 days, so I can't respond to things that I see that are absolutely annoying. Um, but one of the common refrains when it comes to statism you know the you know 
something that they like uh, libertarians and anarchists like to use a, as a pejorative other than as a descriptor of somebody's beliefs. They one of the common things they'll say is, um, oh, you need a you want a state because why do you have to use violence against peaceful people? And it's a good bumper sticker. I like bumper stickers. Um, but, you know, I would ask, are these people peaceful? Are, is the general public peaceful? And I think a lot of them would say, well, they would be peaceful if it wasn't for the state. So the state is basically the boogeyman for everything. It is, it's to be blamed for everything. It's to be blamed for human nature. And, you know, what I would say about, um, you know, and then they'll say, well, you know, if we had, if there was no state and, you know, the market controlled everything and everything was based on economics, you know, if somebody got violent, we could just put together, you know, a bunch of people could get together and they could just nip it in the bud right there. And it's like, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, people have a tendency to tribe up and one tribe is going to, and this is just what history tells us, is stronger than another, is going to be more powerful than another, is going to be more violent than another, is going to be willing to commit total war against another. And I'm not saying the state is here to stop that. I'm just saying that making the broad claim that without a state, things would be better than they are right now. Well, first of all, you have no evidence of that. It's a complete theory. And second of all, making that claim is really childish. If if, if either of you want to push back on that at all, I'm, I'm willing to listen. Um, I can, I guess, in some ways de defend anarchism. I mean, anarchism, anarcho-capitalism, these are fine to have as political myths. You know, there's no real problem with using those in order to help organize people. But in terms of the organizers, the elite, if you will, um, actually attempting to organize your minority at the elite level around the concept of anarchism doesn't actually make any sense. And the, the book, the book actually makes an interesting comment earlier in regards to how capitalism worked. You know, when, when in this era when we had free markets, we basically had free markets by force because the capitalist ruling class came into being and made the society capitalist, right? It was made to be that way. It wasn't just sort of that way in some natural sense. So, you know, this is something I've mentioned before. I mean, you can you can basically have your sort of anarcho-capitalist um, ideal in an, in a very approximate sense if you simply have a elite class ruling uh, somewhat paradoxically um, implementing that system, right? But you still have to actually have the state, if you will, implement anarcho-capitalism, which is somewhat of a contradiction. But according to the theory of this book, which I think is very well demonstrated, that's simply how it must be. Um, and people who style themselves as, as some sort of anarcho-capitalist elite in the sense that they have some intent to, to organize um, for political power, say like a Ron Paul or something. They have to, they have to operate with that recognition. Right. And uh, that might even start looking very similar to what a lot of uh, people who claim to be Hoppian, uh, I'm not going to speak for Hoppe himself just because he puts out such a wide volume of works that I'm not going to try to summarize it, but the people that claim to be Hoppians tend to advocate for a system um, that sounds very similar to what a state is being described as in this book. Um, because you have to remember, whenever whenever in the like page 20 or whenever it is in the first chapter, whenever you introduce the concept of a state, it's not presumed to be some modern system that you can go look around today. There's no like DMV that is necessary in the uh, definition of the state. You know, there's no sort of underclass of uh, you know, lump and proletariat needed to staff it that's, in, uh, that's necessary in the concept of the state. It is literally just the organized minority that has to rule over the majority. And that is a fact in day-to-day -day life. Um, and then that definition is then extrapolated to apply to these four um these four spheres of society that people tried to separate out of that state. Um, but, you know, speaking from earlier on in the book, and that's just 
most books typically will have the uh, the basic axioms or the basic um, ideas early on in the book that you can then always refer back to to try to apply that out of things not explicitly stated in the book. Um, so a lot of Hoppians probably would uh, look at the description of how the state, the uh, minority that rules over the majority, uh, how this book says it comes about and look on it very favorably. That it is both, you know, it is voluntary just because um, uh, the nature of man uh, necessitates that you can't literally just force someone to do absolutely everything you want them to. There has to be some element of voluntary action in there. But then also because of the uh, nature of man, it requires people to organize socially. It's coercive in that way. You know, you, you are tied to that sort of uh, natural uh, need. So um, people that argue for covenant communities that argue for contractual communities and all this other stuff, those types of anarchists that I tend to see as much more real probably wouldn't find that much uh, to object to in this, uh, which is, uh, you know, it repudiates sort of the pie-in-the-sky anarchistic thought that uh, Pete definitely goes off against quite, quite often from what I can tell. Um, and it also sort of affirms the more realist tendencies within these people whenever they see how things actually function which is why these four myths are being stated here. Even though on the surface, if you have not read the book and you just kind of plunge into it right here, uh, they might look very sort of statist in the pejorative term, if you are to use it. Uh, but in reality, when you read through this book, it is just affirming very real facts that you know actual realist libertarians or anarchists have come to grapple with for the past few decades. You know, this is a, a if anything, it's sort of a codifying of those lessons that have been learned is what I would and, say. Uh, just as a point of interest, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe does cite the juvenile extensively in Democracy, the God That Failed. Yeah, and, and Rothbard cites, I think, all three of the Italians used in this book quite extensively in all of his essays. And Hoppe would definitely say that you're looking for, in building these communities, you're looking for pillars of the community or what he calls natural elites. So, um, yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I also wanted to say, um, I've I've said this a few times that you know we could have Ancapistan tomorrow if the elites wanted it, but then if you're looking at the elites that are there now, you have to question why they would want it. You know, you're these people. We want our friends in charge. I mean, that's pretty much to me the the, the message of this book is. There's always going to be a state, and we need our friends in charge of it. We need people who are, who um, think like us and desire desire the things that we want, or else um, we have what we have now. So, all right, I'm gonna keep going. Let so talking about the four myths. Let us do these with each of these in turn. The myth of the stateless society permeates the two competing ideologies of the 20th century: liberalism and socialism. At their extreme ends in anarcho-libertarianism, whether left or right, and communism. Mosca and Michels demonstrate that this is fundamentally wrong-headed because minority organization always prevails from the level of a tribe to the level of global government. Humans are, simply put, the political animal, and what is called the state is simply the fact that there must be there must be the political function that there must be the political function in any society. We go on because I think we've we probably beat that one to death. The second myth that the state is separate from its laws and institutions is shown to be false by Carl Schmitt, who demonstrates that despite liberal pipe dreams, there is no escape from the political. Even though the cloak of neutral or scientific language can be used to mask the ideological content, every institution will bear the mark of the dominant political formula, which acts as a kind of theological holy writ. If the political formula is equality, diversity, and inclusion, there can be no other official bodies or laws that do not conform to it. Samuel T. Francis shows that the managerial elites will not stop their social transformations until all relics and vestiges of the old and despised bourgeois regime are replaced by the new religion at every level of culture down to your local museum. 
Paul Gottfried shows that this is even taken to the domain of science and medicine to the extent those who resist a political formula are diagnosed with mental disorders. Comments? Well, I guess it just, um, this, this really hits hard because I, we were all uh, brought up with the myth that we, you know, we live in a free country, we have free press and all of our ideas are free. But of course, that's just not true at all. Everything that people, you know, we have democratic opinions, right? We don't have like free speech um we have democratic speech you're not allowed anywhere because of the law to you know promote fascism for example if you try to do that you're going to get in serious trouble almost immediately and this this book just eviscerates the idea that the the press and the ideas we have are sort of these free ideas that weren't instituted by some sort of political formula um by the state um all, all of the institutions we have are not free institutions they're democratic institutions at least in terms of the formula and uh it's this is a really important to to hit home uh for people who read this book uh who aren't actually you know familiar with these ideas um sort of disabusing yourself of the myth that all of the ideas that you've been taught are sort of free and not tied to some sort of political formula that's that's a really important aspect of this book that sort of runs alongside the main concepts of elite theory. Right. And like even a minor point to add on to that, because a lot of right wingers have, uh, especially in the last few years, well understood the idea that it's not just what is legally de jure the government, um, but it's also things like the media, uh, things like the press, the public schools and all this other stuff that is that what that is what forms, you know, the idea of the government, this monolithic entity that will just control every facet of your life, whether or not they legally have to answer to the president or the leader of the deep state or depending on who you talk to, you know, whatever boogeyman is hiding under the under the rug. Um, the uh, the contribution here that I don't see many people on the right talking about is, you know, Paul Gottfried's point about the doctors that will diagnose you with mental illness if you dare to go against this political formula, uh, this or the political reality that just sits in front of you. They'll give you, they'll call you uh, uh, mentally deranged. They will have all these uh, medicines or magnetic treatments for your brain, perhaps if you uh, remember that story, to make you less xenophobic. Uh, they will have all these different. Uh, pills prescribed to you if you somehow become uh, so disaffected that you uh, look depressed or any of these other clinical diagnoses. Um, it's not just things that you would naturally associate as being political or legal in nature. It is literally science itself that has to fall under the formula as well. Uh, it is uh, total, uh, much more total than most people talk about. Charlie mentioned the mentioned fascism, that you can't even talk about fascism. And um, we saw this Georgia Maloney who got elected in Italy. And we were on the live stream last night, I was doing with Thomas, someone asked him, you know, how close she is to um, Mr. Big, Big Chin Man from the 1920s. And uh, Thomas said, her message is no different than Tony Blair's in 1997 coming to coming to power. She's no Tony Blair had the same message. So to try to compare him to 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 call it fascism is really a is exposing that therapeutic state that Paul Gottfried talks about is that there is something wrong with this woman. And, um, you know, I, I'm I'm at the point where I think that, you know, they may just re, reinstate lobotomies to try and help people you know, get past this. I mean, that's uh, what was the, uh, the certain uh, scientists from a middle Eastern country of origin were developing yeah. magnetic treatments. Uh, you know, that famous story that everyone freaked out about. I mean, that might, you might as well just lobotom lobotomize yeah. people at that point. Um, but like, even just to hammer the point home, you're told from a young age, you know, trust your doctor on these medical ideas and all this other stuff is no different than trust the government to carry out the will of the people uh, at this point. It's uh, it's such a political organ that, that it's, it's yeah. no different. All right. Go on. 
The third myth that the state and the economy could ever be separated, the myth of the free market, is the central tenet of classical liberalism. Bertrand de Juvenel shows that since since the political comes prior to any economy, the economy itself can never and will never escape politics. James Burnham shows that laissez-faire was simply the political formula of the capitalists who gained power in the 19th century, but this, because of the practicalities of mass and scale, gave way to managerialism and the fusion of corporate interests and the state. We have seen how even the economy in the managerial state is a top-down process. The consumer is not sovereign, despite the slogans. The managerial class used the roles of executives at large corporations and financial institutions to set directives and mission statements for the foreseeable time horizon. The reason organizations such as the UN and the World Economic Forum can announce their visions for Agenda 2030 is because the economy itself is managed. Now, as Charlie and I come from libertarianism, and Ryan, I believe you are a economics major right now, right? <laughs> yes, and entrepreneurship. I, I am studying under uh, Pear Bylan, so, you know, this is all... Yeah. Uh, oh, I was never a libertarian, for the record. Were you not? No, never. Uh, definitely close. Um, close okay. around maybe 2015 or something, but never Wait, quite there. Where were you on Austrian economics? I mean, I, I think as uh, Mr. Parvini would say, I I agree with the Austrian economics is 100% correct in terms of how uh, human action functions, but it it's not a political formula. It's okay. it's it's the descri- it's the objective description of human economic action, much like elite theory is the objective description of human power. Well, what do you think about the statement here that either you can take this that um, because since the political comes prior to any economy, the economy itself can never and will never escape politics. Do you believe that's true that the pol- the political will always, because there are a lot of people out there they call themselves an- anarcho-capitalists who believe that you can actually build a society off of economics. Well, come before is, is sort of a strange turn of phrase in a way. I mean, these things Comes always prior. exist simultaneously. If there's human beings, they're going to be making economic decisions and they're going to be making decisions regarding power. Um, so these things always exist simultaneously. And economics is is a description of, of how humans trade with each other. But power is always going to be able to supersede that. You can, of course, have power sort of as, as the earlier chapter alluded to or stated directly when you have a capitalist ruling class you can allow the economy to operate freely but that's always at the behest of power and you know power is always going to come into being as soon as you even have a small tribe of people so uh, you know if you have only one person uh, even he again Pervini even mentions the Robinson Crusoe situation somewhere earlier in the book you know if you just have one person or maybe two people on a deserted island and there's no real power relationship you're not going to have a tribe uh, having a tribe of two people i guess you could technically call it a tribe but on- only in these weird um edge cases does do power relationships not emerge to um subsume economic activity so yeah i fundamentally agree with his debunking of the third myth you got anything right sorry i couldn't yeah sorry i um so the only the thing that I disagree with is the idea that the political becomes uh, political organization, polit- the political uh, sphere of life precedes economic, uh, the economic sphere, uh, just because it's uh, both of them are fundamentally social. And it seems strange to me to say that in every single case, uh, power relations will precede exchange. Um, but this is this could ultimately just be seen as hair splitting because it, it's ultimately going to end up the answer is at the same time they will come about, um, which doesn't you know absolve um, any of these ideas from the criticism here. It's just it's more just the uh, the certainty that this uh, that political life precedes the economic. Um, now, 
with all of that, uh, the jab at consumer sovereignty at the end, I can understand why he would take it, just because uh, most people have so distorted it to mean that the consumer just directs and controls everything. Uh, when in reality, it is simply just can the consumer choose to purchase or not purchase or withhold money, uh, and, or and not even do they have different options, just can they choose to purchase? Um, at its very base meaning, uh, this is still true. But then you do end up with the question, does that mean they're actually sovereign? Well, depends on what you mean by sovereign. Uh, I understand the jab, why he takes the jab there. I don't think he's necessarily attacking the uh, properly understood uh, concept there. But for all intents and purposes, the sort of pop definition of it that you would get at like a business class or a marketing class, um, by all means, that has still been debunked. Uh, but at least here, I'm not exactly forced to purchase Pepsi or Coca-Cola. I can just not purchase either, which under the traditional definition does mean that I still have sovereignty. Now, you know, in the coming future where there might be a, uh, you know, a political commissar standing on the grocery aisle enforcing a diversity quota in my purchases, then I might need to start purchasing, in which case now you can, you can debunk it. But th this is uh, economics, autism, and hair splitting. Uh, but I might as well be thorough if we're going to, if we're going to treat this seriously. Sure. And if you look at the, so trying to separate, um, in the early colonies, there, mm -hmm. the, the early colonies, they had, there was a great degree of freedom that they had from the crown and being 3000 miles yes. away helped a lot. Um, but then you read Patrick Newman's book, Cronyism, and he starts in 1607 and right. what you what you're seeing is you're seeing that whenever it doesn't matter if you're just here, if you just showed up on a boat and you're with a bunch of the cronyism always exists. And to try to, and I, I, I hear people and I, I probably used to say this all the time too. You could probably find audio of me saying it, that, you know, a free market would solve that problem. A free market could actually make it worse. I mean, there could be just much more collusion in laissez-faire of companies coming together. Um, I think the idea that monopolies won't happen because people could just, people would be able to start a company that morning because there are no regulations um, against starting a company. Um, if I had a big company, I would just buy that person out. I mean, I would offer them so much money that they would be like, okay, well, it's, it would take me years to make this amount of money. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, yeah. So the, right. <laughs> the, the idea that the, that competition is going to solve every problem and, um, laissez-faire is going to solve every problem. You know, and I think we've said this, I've said this numerous <laughs> times, it's like really the, the freest market that you see now is basically the black market. And even the black market, their prices are going to be dictated by the prices in white markets. So, right. And then of course, just to hammer the point home, you, you will come back to sort of the other autistically economic talking point of, well, if there is a monopoly that naturally comes about, does that mean it's bad? Could be. You know, it could be it, it could be our friends run it so it's good it could be that it's someone we are ultimately indifferent about that runs it and they just do it well then okay fine uh really uh, realistically and politically this is only a bad thing if it's our enemies running it and if they do actually have a genuine monopoly just because they are good at what they are doing uh th that's when it becomes a bad thing but in other words, <laughs> keeping with the realistic analysis, you don't just have to economically uh, challenge them. There are other ways to challenge those sorts of uh, those sorts of people. Right, and I think we can attest to. And I think a government that actually did protect the rights of the people, only the most autistic of anarchists would be against it. You know, that protected our rights. That where the military was just there to make sure that we were safe, that the police were there to make sure we're safe. Um, I, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's hard the world, especially after the last two and a half years and um, really try to nail down why there are some people who are still talking about statelessness and talk about it on a, I mean, that's their main talking point instead of it just being like the North Star or something like that. All right, I'm going to go to the fourth myth. The fourth myth is that there 
that there is a separation of powers in a liberal democracy, which is to say that there are checks and balances between the various branches of government. This is largely collapsed by the incisive analysis of Schmidt and the process of power's tendency to seek to conquer feudal castles identified by, Ju- by Juvenal. It is worth noting that at least three of these th- of the thinkers covered, Mosca, Burnham, and Juvenal himself, favor a system by which centralization or the convergence of power centers is held in a kind of equilibrium through a constant struggle even if in practice they recognize the extreme, the extreme difficulty of achieving this. I'll go on if no one has anything to say. While it appears that populism largely failed, not because it was not supported by the masses, but because of political naivete, that does not mean a circulation of the elites is not due as the lies and manipulations of the managerial regime become more and more visible to a public that has become widely skeptical of our current global globalist elites and the system that supports them agitation for significant change will continue apace attempts to maintain official narratives and maintain free and fair elections will become more difficult please i want this I wanted I wanted them to build a wall around the Capitol after January 6. It strikes me that the system that then faces many possible points of failure, which include de facto balkanization, the need to the need for more explicit coercion and the use of force, a high low middle mechanism whereby national governments become the middle while supranational globalist governance structures become the high and local regions become the middle. Bioleninism, or in other words, degradation of the elites and exclusion of people of superior skills and talents causes the ruling class to become complacent and or inept, eclipsed by foreign powers. There is one more that he leaves out, and this just could be because I didn't read clearly enough, or it could be because it was uh, infeasible at the time of writing this. Um And it is the fact that uh, the sort of managerial method of organization that we're operating under, uh, we accept that thesis by Burnham Burnham because he he operates under the assumption that it works more profitably for the people in power than any other organization method does. Um, And what you're currently seeing, especially in the last couple of months, is that that might not actually be the case. Um, because you have to you have to wonder how much money do they need to print, how many foreign governments do they need to coerce to keep the dollars there was as the uh, global reserve currency, um, how big can this bureaucracy get with their you know autistic specializations of management where you'll have like a manager for like specific emotions and like a in a uh, in a team and then you have a manager for uh, you know interrelations between groups you know how bloated can this get. And then, you know, how much sort of financial black magic and wrangling can they do before you've had one bubble that popped way too big and it just brings everyone down? That is, uh, to summarize all of this, uh, it could also be as well that the sort of managerial method of organization is collapsing in on itself. You got something, Charlie? What I will say is the, yeah, and he says in in the next uh, paragraph, at the time of writing, we were seeing all five of these in their nascent state. Um, De facto balkanization, we saw that pretty clearly with the COVID regime in a couple states, um, most notably Florida. Uh, The need for more explicit coercion and the use of force. Uh, no more so than the way the January 6th tourists were handled and um, you know, FBI raiding um, Mar-a-Lago, the, the home of a former president, um, real kind of banana republic um, kind of things. Um, Bioleninism, I mean, look at some of the people that that are in charge right now. I mean, I, I could, you can even say, you can even look at the vice president of the United States. I mean, it's just got. Right. And look at the uh, universities where they turn out their elites um, just by the methods that uh, most state universities organize. 
And uh, with a lot of these sort of backlash that private universities are getting, it is unfeasible to hold high standards anymore. Uh, yeah. At public universities, they have this sort of quasi sort of Weimar-esque democratic system where the students kind of rate their uh, professors. And if the professors get too low a rating, their pay gets cut. They get barred from teaching these things. And you need to teach in order to keep employment. Uh, you get barred from tenure and all this other stuff. Um, and then in private schools where they have much more uh, control over their classrooms, well, you know, students just write petitions. You get enough uh, protected classes to sign on to the petition to where it makes a media headline, then the professor just gets fired wholesale. Uh, they're, they're, um, elite, their centers for churning out new elites are actively lowering their standards by design and opening themselves up to just being completely outclassed. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be everything, though I don't know if there is a field that is resisting this sort of slide in standards, uh, but it, it just takes a couple things for the uh, current elites to just be completely outclassed and humiliated and for them to just lose their mandate, you know, uh, to be unfeasibly seen as rulers. I want to uh, add to what you said earlier about the managerial method possibly becoming less profitable. The way I gauge what's happening right now is that the managerial method is becoming more and more profitable for the governing elite, which are the managers, but it's becoming more profitable for a smaller and smaller segment of them. So I think we are, we're getting to the point where the managers are benefiting, but only the very, very upper echelons of the managers are really seeing the benefits of all of the monetary inflation inflation, and other things we see going on right now. Well, do you think that there is a war because of that? There's a war going on between the elites right now. Um, you know, you point, you can point to Roe v. Wade being overturned, um, a number of gun decisions, things like that. Um, it seems like there are some people working in the background who are working um, against the the wishes and um, the goals of the ruling elites right now. Right, because most of the managers are now effectively just being treated like the kulaks so once we're at the point where you know i think it's inarguable that the the inflation and other regulations we've seen have been of insanely high benefit to a tiny amount of people but when you're only actually benefiting a small part of the ruling class like that you're actually going to get your counter elite forming so the counter elite may very well form out of the disaffected managers which is exactly what you would expect based on the theses of this book. Um, so that's where we ought to look to uh, for um, uh, <laughs> be, uh, being saved from this horrible system is the uh, the disaffected managers. Right, and just to bolster that point, just around here, sort of in you know the periphery of the empire, if you will, Oklahoma, you know, plains land with uh, not a lot of development, no real structure or centers of uh, anything except for maybe Tulsa. Um, all the people that literally do manage in these large corporations, especially the oil stuff around here, something very key to your uh, current system of elites, whether they realize it or not. Um, basically, all of the managers absolutely hate what's happening, but they just don't have an alternative. So, you know, there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, sort of uh, group and a potential minority coalition there to latch onto, and basically, all you have to do is say. You know, we aren't even necessarily going to change much. We just aren't going to make you do the retarded crap. Uh, and you've already got a segment for a sort of uh, organized uh, one of the groups in a minority coalition that's ready to just go on, and a very key one at that. They're uh, you know, the managers in the managerial system. Hmm. All right. Let me. I'm pretty sure I'm finishing this up with this last paragraph. Yep. All right. Last par paragraph. At the time of writing, we are seeing all five of these things in their nascent state. The political pressure from the public on elected leaders due to the sheer unpopularity of the policies enacted may, event may eventually cause them to break decisively with globalist elites. This remains likely so long as nations maintain standing armies. Strong indications in France and elsewhere seem to make it almost inevitable that there will be at least 
there will at least be a nominal struggle for national sovereignty against globalist overreach. The political capital spent on the COVID-19 pandemic will exacerbate this, especially given the economic hardship it seems to be bringing. European populations may have a stated preference to achieve net zero carbon by 2030, but in practice it is extremely unlikely that elites will be able to push ahead with their utopian visions without violent protest. As the situation worsens, people will become more serious and organized having learned from the populist experiences between 2016 and 2020. Elites, of course, always have an option to reverse course in a bid to reverse these trends, but one suspects that they be- that they believe their own visions which, with a missionary zeal. I don't know that I agree with that. If they do not, the will to power is such that their lust for ever greater control will not let up until power is taken from them by a better organized elite with a political formula better suited to the populations they are supposed to serve. I strongly doubt that this new elite, when they emerge, whether by democratic means or otherwise, will be able to break decisively enough from liberal and democratic myths to do what is necessary to keep Western nations from experiencing certain disaster in the future. However, after decades of chronic mismanagement from the current managers, perhaps all we hope for is a vaguely sensible replacement for a few years who in- whose interests will be closer to those of, quote unquote, the people. Um, I wonder to, to what extent uh, he still believes everything in that paragraph, because I've seen <laughs> academic agent, you know, put forward um his belief that they're sort of rolling back some of the worst aspects of uh, uh, green and woke and everything. And some of his studies of Tony's Blair. So I wonder if he would uh, wonder if he would disagree now with some of the things he wrote there. Just an well, interesting have, question to ask. Have you, have either of you seen that the world economic forum, one of the books that they recommend is <laughs> Dr. Robert, Ro- Dr. Robert Murphy's modern money mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, that, that is a good point. And uh, I think that almost everyone was sort of overestimating the extent that they were just fully and uh, plastically committed to uh, going along with everything that they've been pushing the elites, um, because all it took was, you know, one threat like winter isn't even here yet for most of Europe. It took one threat of a winter of extreme discontent. And suddenly you get uh, various supposedly hardline green governments going back and redefining, saying, well, I guess natural gas and uh, nuclear power could be back on the menu again. They, they're, I mean, mostly green. Um, and then you get all of, a bunch of other, uh, I believe it's sort of like the smaller countries, uh, especially Denmark comes to mind where their left wing party fitting with uh, fitting with sort of like the Danish left wing traditions is, is uh, taking this chaotic uh uh, wave as an opportunity and starting to sh- uh, close down their border again, uh, trying to preserve Danish demographics. Even though I believe in the past you would have a lot of these Danish left-wing parties going out in support of uh, immigration because it's the popular thing to say. Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of people might have overestimated, including potentially me, I don't quite remember what I said on this topic for uh, the last few months, I think everyone might have overestimated the extent to which they are committed, the sort of missionary zeal that is uh, written in the book here. I want to add, too, because he mentioned something, again, that's really important, which is understanding what the middle actually is in the Juvenalian model of high-low versus middle. Notice how he, again, frames the national governments as the middle here. Um, and it's really important to understand in that frame that middle doesn't just mean middle class. Um, it In the American system, it to some extent does map to that, but it's a much concept than just the, the idea of middle class. Um, and that's just interesting, too, because it highlights the importance of having national governments that are opposed to globalism as globalism is the final convergence of all the power centers to the point where there will be no, there'll be nothing left to converge on. So that's a really important uh, point to consider is that we need to make sure our national governments are in fact not acting as, um, not acting complicitly in the globalist system and are actually attempting to 
act in the interest of the middle. Well, one of the interesting things about that last paragraph is he talks about people basically growing um, weary and of the government and questioning the government and you know, Ukraine, Nord Stream two, all of this. It's you know, Germany's looking like they're going to have a, a very rough winter. Um, although I've heard that their reserves are only down like 3%. So um, it looks like they can get through the winter, thankfully. But there is hope. It's just <laughs> one thing that you know you get from reading this book is, okay, so who, who sweeps in as the hero of the day? Who sweeps in to what elites are going to solve this problem? You know, it's, I've, I've said recently, I don't know if publicly or privately, but it seems like really the, the one elite that I look at who seems to be the closest to being on our side, and I don't trust him at all, is Peter Thiel. He's the only one who's giving money to people that we agree with and um, pushing certain ideas that you know, I think a, a Blake Masters is saying the right things. I mean, he's been associated with Teal for a very, very long time. So, um, yeah, I think the one thing that this book really helps you to understand, and you can even mix this in with Hoppe, is you're looking for elites. You're looking for elites who are, who share your values. And um, I, I think that's the white pill from this book. The white pill is that you don't, you don't have to start a revolution. You don't have to pick up arms that may happen um, by default in certain areas. But the white pill is you raise up the right people and you can have what you want and these people can be overthrown. And in terms of the national governments, again, one of the interesting things that happened recently is, you know, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was destroyed. And it seems like basically everybody just assumed the Americans did it, um, which <laughs> would be inconceivable um, lifetime, right? Like that would be the last thing you would think is that the Americans did it. And now we have other um, American allies, so to speak, basically uh, – just assuming, even if they don't state it outright, that America was behind um, an act of terrorism, essentially, on European countries. Ryan, I have, uh, unless you guys have anything else to add on that topic, because I was going to switch ever so slightly. Go ahead. Um, yeah. All righty. Um, so uh, he does mention in here sort of like a black pill that he just slips in right at the end of the conclusion. He says he strongly doubts that a new elite, uh, when they emerge, for whatever means will be able to break decisively enough from these myths in order to save the West, basically. Um, yeah. This is strange to me, because I know he is very well read on the Bolshevik movement in Russia. And if you look at every single thing that they were telling the populace, that they were telling the elites that they got on side, that they were telling foreign governments, um, it was absolutely nothing like what they actually had planned and executed. Um, there were some moments where they would go out to the crowd and basically tell them directly what they would do if they were in government, and it actually came to pass. Um, but there were just, a, quite frankly, a lot of lies that they would throw out to people. Uh, you know, it would be much more democratic. They promised much more popular sovereign rule uh, through Russia, which in reality they did absolutely everything they can because they uh, that they could because they understood the system here uh, that – this popular, this popularly sovereign system that they implemented was absolutely under their control. They knew how the game worked. Uh, but nonetheless, they would still promise to people it would be a golden democratic age uh, that would descend across Russia. Um, so uh, you can have elites that can preach these myths in order to get people on side and all of that, and you can even paint the actions that they will take to look like they are still following these popularly held myths that you cannot break from with the population, uh, but you can still just completely ca uh, contradict them through very, uh, I don't want to say subversive means, but a uh, sort of very uh, uh, hidden means, if you will. Yeah, you know, because it, everything that the uh, Bolsheviks promised, for instance, to keep that definite, to keep that uh, example, um, they did carry it out. They did bring democracy to Russia and all of this. It's just that they so, so knew the system they were going to work with uh, that it was there was no choice, quite obviously. 
quite famously. So y you can do the same. I don't think this is the black pill that he is uh, making it out to be at the end here. I also think that people are starting to read things that they haven't read in the past. You know, I've heard Blake Masters talk about Ted Kaczynski. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> for somebody who's running for Senate to do that is, you know, and I've actually seen a couple right wing voices talking about Yaki. So <laughs> sure, maybe these people aren't elites. I mean, I think to me, a Blake Masters is an elite. I look at him as for better, or for worse. I mean, we don't know who's we, we know, you don't really know what's in somebody's heart, but at least these are people who are quoting, you know, they're not quoting um, Jonah Goldberg. You know, they're quoting people who have, uh, who think differently and also who are able to diagnose the problems of the day at a very deep level. Yeah, I entirely agree there. So, uh, and not only do we have that, what you just mentioned, and not only do we have what I just mentioned there, but um, our side seems to be the only one actively courting competent people. Uh, I, I think I never actually read or listened through this just because every single time the subject has come up, I've been in exams or midterms. I think that's the concept of the base draft. You know, get the highly competent people that agree with you to just either when they get kicked out of the industry or uh, coerce them to leave the or, uh, sorry, convince them to leave the industry. Uh, you know, you will have the only competent people left. And it doesn't matter how uh, uh, technically or on paper, how well positioned your elites currently are, if they're your enemy, if they're incompetent, they are just going to fall apart. You know, if they can't play the game, if they cannot uh, secure their position, if they can't use their position, they can't stay there. Uh, especially if you're better. Uh, someone always is. So uh, that's the that's the sort of three things I would use to repudiate this uh hidden black pill that he just throws in at this very last paragraph of the book. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess in order to to back up the black pill, one thing I don't see happening in terms of this based draft is the kulaks or the middle are really just not organized, not organizing at all. Um, that's really the mission right now, I think, for people like us is to actually get that organization kickstarted because it's really not happening. Um, and sort of all agreeing on ideas and meeting and having streams like this isn't organization, right? I mean, it's it's sort of leading in that direction, but actual real organization um, is when you have a, a group of elites actually leading some sort of minority and aggregating their ability to exercise influence, be that through money or some sort of social position they have, you actually have to have an elite utilizing that collective people power. And we, we really don't have that happening at all. Um, we have a sort of intellectual elite um, who do streams like this, right? But that's, that's a far cry from actually organizing any of the people who might be listening right now. Right, at least not officially. We don't have people actively taking stock of what talents do we have, what resources do we have, what money do we have available, and uh, also, again, at least not officially, we don't have people saying on this date we are going to do this at this location. We don't have actual plans being organized and carried out and executed. Uh, we, uh, If you took it so broadly, you can say that's happening on these streams, but then the definition is so broad it doesn't mean anything, because these streams aren't actually... Um, you know, we aren't showing up to these streams with the intention and talking about how we're going to win feasible power at this location at this time for this purpose. Uh, that would be absolutely brilliant to do, but it's not quite what we're geared towards. It's not what audiences want and all that, and it's not our purpose here, quite frankly. Um, so whenever we talk about we need people to actively organize, it means on that level, be it sort of at the project head, sort of like the grand planning, or at sort of like the, to use corporate language, the team level. You know, you're five people. How do you get? How do you keep this plan in in motion? You know, what can the six of you do? So, I, it's hard when you when the pagans and the Christians are 
fighting against each other, and then the Protestants and the Catholics are fighting against each other. Um, we have a pretty good example of people who put their you know, put their religious differences aside to come together and defeat a force in their country. Um, well, except one religion that they that had to go, but they came together and they just said, "Well, <laughs> we have a foe here, and it's it's more important than it's." it's more important than our, um, than our religious differences, then we need to come together. And the more, the more I see that the, the fighting just over, Oh, well, the pagans are like, well, look what Christians have done in the past. And Christians are like, Oh, look what pagans have done in the past. Look at the children that are being sacrificed now. Um, Maybe we on this note, I would put forward that, uh, it might be the case that certain enterprising Americans are actually, working to tackle this problem more directly in the near future. So maybe pay attention to this sphere um, if you're interested in that. Very much so. Yes. All right. I'll give each of you a chance to um, say a last word if you want and promote anything you want. So uh, Ryan, go ahead first. Well, um, just to summarize my thoughts about the book um, and you know, I probably could do a much deeper reading that doesn't have to be done in the course of a couple days or so, but I was uh, genuinely very impressed, um, and I had a feeling I would uh, be coming out and saying that, um, but it reads very clearly. Uh, there's very precise, very direct. The definitions aren't vague, um, and it, it's, a, it's genuinely, uh, I don't want to say entertaining, but it's fulfilling to read. Um, it's, it's a great book. Go read it. Uh, easy to find, easy to pay for and contribute uh, to a person that most definitely is acting in your interest at least 95% of the time. Um, <laughs> uh, that is a safe, uh, a friend. Um, and uh, with that being said, though, um, with a lot of the things that are being that are being articulated in this book, um, you might go into it thinking that it is just a one giant black pill. You know, you have to f use shadowy means to fight these shadowy elites that are in these uh, official positions positions that can't be assaulted. Um, it's not that. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, he does a good job at making this just cold practicality. You can go home and use this, uh, this book that we just read, um, to your advantage. Uh, not like in some sort of psychopathic Machiavellian sense, like go get a promotion at work, but uh, uh, you, know, you can use this to actually see what's going on in politics and do something yourself, because uh, a lot of the people that we have in our sphere would be absolutely perfect to do these political organizations uh, that we keep talking about, we just don't get, probably because we don't know how to, or we're scared to move first, something like that. Um, it's not that difficult, this book makes that abundantly clear. Uh, that you just need to be competent. We have competent people. You need to be tightly organized. That is definitely very possible. You need to have a political formula. That's and that's not beyond us to come up with uh, if we don't just choose one that's out there already. Um, so our situation is, uh, it, it could be infinitely worse. Uh, we have everything we need. Uh, we have everything that we uh, can organize with. All we just need to do now is act, really. Uh, act and plan and execute. So uh, that's that's my final thoughts, really, uh, especially since we're dealing with the conclusion. Charles? I must say that uh, there was a moment about a third of the way through the book where I just thought, wow, this is an absolutely stellar book, which is actually pretty rare. Um, this is an excellent scholarly work. It's well-sourced, the bibliography, the all-important bibliography is stuffed full of references. Um, don't let the size of the book deceive you. It's small, but actually compressing the core ideas of all of these intellectuals into a short, readable form that really delivers the, the core concepts from all these works, these tens of thousands of pages of works, um, is a huge achievement. Um, this is absolutely a book that you should read and buy. I'm actually thinking about buying 10 copies and handing them out at my local city council because the, the book is really that good. I mean, it's only a little more than 100 pages. You can read it in one sitting if you want. And um, it is it's it is actually amazing that um, Nima Parvini was, was able to do what he did in this book and compress all of these enormous texts into something very concise that has a very um, clear narrative from beginning to the end. So yeah, I'm, and I'm not just saying that because 
he's a friend. It, it, it really is um, an excellent work. It, it might be, in a technical level, the, the best book that Imperium Press actually has on their site. Um, so, yeah, I found it remarkable. Yeah. And thank Mike from Imperium Press for uh, not only publishing this book, for but for publishing a host of amazing books and being able to uh, put works together into um you know like the maestro's volume one to be able to put all the most important writings into one um he's doing amazing work over there um do you have anything to plug charlie oh just check out my sub stack i'm doing my uh my book notes series and just publishing on there regularly. I have uploaded a couple short videos to my YouTube channel lately, but yeah, if you want to support me financially, the Substack is the place to go for that. And I do try to put out worthwhile content for the readers there. And I'm just, um, I'm just finishing up my CIA theme, um, which I <laughs> is basically all composed of books that Thomas seven, seven recommended, um, which were all very good. So if you're interested in uh, learning about the history of the CIA, I'm about to publish the fourth article, the fourth paid article on my Substack stack um, in a week or two. So charlemagne.substack.com. Awesome. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining me. And uh, this, this was great. A lot. <laughs> Not as an insult at all. This was way beyond my expectations. This was friggin' amazing. Thank you.